My name is Kevin McKeown, and uh, I'm going to be your uh, your um, MC, I guess, for this afternoon. Um, I want to uh, <coughs> thank you all for for being here and uh, and sharing this special moment with us. I, uh, um, Marguerite asked me to MC, and I said sure without thinking much about it. And, uh, as soon as I look out over this crowd, I'm thinking to myself. Oh, Francis, what have you gotten me into this time? <laughs> but uh, um, I'd like to uh, to start, as I, I always like to do, by acknowledging that we are we are gathered here today on traditional Coast Salish territory, and we are mindful and we are grateful. Thank you. Um, we have a, a a pretty packed agenda of people who want to share their love for Francis and. And uh, I sent those of you on the speakers list a memo very early this morning when I was sort of fretting about this, um, asking that we sort of try and keep individual uh, things as, as tight as possible, uh, try not to repeat things that we've already heard so that we can keep things moving so that everyone can have a chance to share, and that would be great. We're going to, uh, we're going to begin uh, first with a, a message from Marguerite. I guess I have to I have to concede to advancing age. And this is uh, from Marguerite, who declines to do this herself. But. I love you, brother. I love you too, <laughs> and, and you know, if I choke up at various intervals, I'm sure you'll understand too. When Francis and I first met back in 1997, it was March and it was midnight. I was hanging out in a chat room with my friend Jane, who lived north of me, and in bounced Francis. She filled that screen with her presence. As we hung out with each other, we quickly realized we all came from creative backgrounds. I said something like, we should write a play, and that is exactly what we did. The play followed the lines of the queen of the Tillanook Dairy Parade meeting the handsome local woman animal doctor. <laughs> I won't bore you with the rest of the details, except to say that the next three hours were magic. 700 miles apart, and with only a screen between us, she took my breath away. What a night that was, I was hooked. In the spirit of that eventful meeting so long ago, today we come full circle, 19 years later, to celebrate a most extraordinary woman, and in the same creative way Francis and I first met, join me now in opening your hearts and sharing your stories of what she was to each of you. Thank you, Marguerite. We're we have we have uh, a, a, a song or two to start with, and then we have, we have two uh, talented and popular storytellers who are going to share some stories with us, and then uh, I will call each of you up to the mic. You're welcome to either come up on the stage and use this mic, or just uh, come up to, on the floor here, and that's a, a wireless mic that you can use as well, so it's up to you, whatever you're most comfortable with. I'd like to ask uh, Menon Ruel to please uh, come forward. There we are. Hi, everybody. Is this working? Yes. Uh, when I first met um, Francis, it was our first Sappho Circle, which was in 2004 when we created that. Movie. And uh, Francis and Marguerite, we were there with young. Uh, you, you two were very there for me when I came out, and I really wanted to honor this song that, that it's actually the Woman's Warrior song, which really, um, there's no word to express how much of a warrior she was as a woman. Also, there's four verses of the song, and then when, you, when we sing the third one, we raise our right arm. And if you want to think of someone that is strong, that, that can't stand, but they're there, just 
raise for, for your arm for it. especially a life like Frances's in just a few words, let alone to a little boy who'd never met her. Well, I began. Her name was Frances. Frances was my first women's studies teacher at Langara College when I was 22. I am still grateful pretty much every single day for the life-changing experience that was my time at Langara. In the beginning, Frances terrified me. <laughs> okay, I never actually stopped being terrified of Francis, but in the beginning I was flat out terrified. Physically, she was intimidating, sure, but it was more than just her tall stature. It feels like some kind of lesbian feminist stereotype to say she was an Amazon, but Francis was a damn Amazon. <laughs> The way that some people might describe somebody as an angel, I don't believe in angels, but I do believe in Francis. It was about how she carried herself, how she stood tall and took up space unapologetically, and how she didn't have time for your bullshit. As I told my son, she did not suffer fools gladly. In a word, Francis was direct. She looked you in the eye and expected something of you. It wasn't confrontational, just more along the lines of, why wouldn't I expect something of you? Don't you expect something of yourself? I, frown, I found Fr Francis frightfully intimidating, so I set about doing what I do when I want people I'm afraid of to like me. I tried to make her laugh. Luckily for me, Francis also had a great sense of humor. Making Francis laugh gave me a satisfaction so deep it was silly. And for years, when Frances was funny herself, it took me a second to be sure. Wait, was that a joke? God, what if I laugh and it wasn't a joke? <laughs> Is it possible to actually die from her looking over her glasses at me? <laughs> I 
it made the eventual laugh all that much more delicious. Friends has taught me that being funny can be an integral part of my feminism. Thank you, Francis. While at 5'3", without the heels, I can't begin to pull off intimidating like Frances could, but thanks to her, I learned how to hold myself as tall as she stood and look anyone directly in the eye. I can't always manage it, but the older I get, the easier it becomes and the better it feels. So thank you, Frances. Almost a decade after my time at Langara, Frances came back into my life. I'd landed an important job that I was very excited about. It felt like a pretty big coup and I was filled with passion and dedication and things started off okay. And I was doing a pretty good job, but eventually my inexperience and my naivety and my lack of understanding about the sometimes unhealthy motivations, be they intentional or not, of human beings resulted in things starting to crumble. I'd recently run into Frances at an event. By this point, she was executive director of the Vancouver Folk Music Festival and was running things there. No small undertaking, no big surprise. When I needed help, I turned to Frances, who came to my aid like, well, like the Amazon she was. By then I was so filled with self-doubt, self so confused about what I should be doing with my life, I was absolutely falling apart. One day, in a flood of tears and run-on sentences, which she did not care for, I told Frances, all the criticisms leveled at me by some of the people I was working with, how they'd said this and told me I needed to do that, and how I felt powerless to fix things. Frances waited until I'd stopped for a breath. Then she looked at me in the eye and said calmly, these are the thoughts of stupid people. <laughs> you are right here. They are wrong. And that was all it took, and I knew I was gonna be okay. And that these are the thoughts of stupid people would become one of my most favorite expressions in the entire world. Francis taught me that it's okay to name it when people act stupidly and to respond to them accordingly. She reminded me that I was smarter than I was giving myself credit for. I wish I could say I learned that lesson firmly, but I fall into thinking everyone is smarter than me a lot. I often have to remind myself to check in with reality rather than bowing down to the thoughts of stupid people, but I doubt myself much less now, so thank you, Francis. Spending as many years as I did intimidated by Francis, the day she told me one of her secrets brought me much closer to understanding what being bold actually involves. It involves bangles. <laughs> Anyone who knows Frances will have a hard time imagining her without her signature silver bangles adorning both arms. One day I was preparing for a meeting. I anticipated being confrontational and I was in a complete panic. Frances jangled her bracelets at me and calmly asked, do you think this is jewelry? <laughs> This is armor, she told me. Every time I have to speak in front of people, every time I have to attend a meeting where I know some man will tell me I don't know what I'm talking about, I feel these on my arms and they can't touch me. I had seen Frances on more than one occasion, very calmly and with a biting sense of humor, take down much bigger men than she at meetings. Knowing that she had to consciously step into that bravery made me think I could do it too. So thank you, Frances. When my mom died suddenly in 2007, my wife Michelle and I spent a month in a daze packing up her home. Once that was done, the shock began to wear off, the grief began to set in, and the loss hit me with the strength of a freight train. My wife suggested we get away somewhere for a few days just to rest and grieve. It seemed a very complicated thing to do. We needed to be somewhere relaxing and private where we could feel comforted but not be expected to return anyone's smiles if we couldn't man manage it. We found the perfect place when Francis and Marguerite welcomed us to their bed and breakfast on the Sunshine Coast, Honeysuckle Cottage. When I needed it, Francis sat with me in their beautiful garden, overflowing with life, and she talked to me. When I needed it, Michelle and I stayed in the guest house and cried watched movies, stared at walls, and grieved. When I think of that time, I am still overwhelmed with gratitude. I can't imagine being able to be exactly where I was emotionally anywhere else. It was a softer, gentler Francis I experienced on that trip, one who didn't expect me to be brave or even consider donning armor 
But once again, Francis had quietly, calmly held me up and helped me know that I was gonna be okay. So thank you, Francis, and thank you, Marguerite. There are many more Frances stories I could tell in which over the past couple of decades she's taught me so much about things like organizational management, marriage immigration, bookkeeping, and the fight for abortion rights in Canada, but it was the way she lived, how big she loved, how hard she laughed, how bravely she fought, and most of all, how committed she was to mentoring the likes of me, for which I am forever indebted to her. I'm not the only one who has stories of Francis to tell. I know so many people who can trace back pieces of ourselves that we love directly to Francis. She didn't create those pieces, but she held us up so we could figure out how to use them. She looked us in the eye and inspected us to figure them out. Her mouth turned up at the corner in a smile or her cheeks ruddied with laughter and she encouraged us to step into everything we were worth. Sometimes she instructed us directly, sometimes she led by example, but always she cleared the way. If we can be half the people she taught us to be, we too will be nothing short of Amazons. So buddy, I said, she was someone very important to me, and at many times in my life she taught me so much. I'm really sad that Frances didn't get to live to a very old age because that's what should have happened. Yeah, he said, I'm sorry you're sad. I took a deep breath and I marveled at the compassion of my boy who had just quietly, calmly sat through all my tearful stories about my teacher, my mentor, my friend, and I was grateful. Later that day, exhausted from crying, I had to get ready to go out and be entertaining at an event somehow. I felt overwhelmed by the idea, but at the same time, that it was just what I wanted to be doing. Reaching into the cupboard where I keep my jewelry, I pulled out my bangles and a big glittery bracelet. Armored up, I knew I'd been well trained and I could do this. So thank you, Francis, for everything. I love you so much. Thank you. she go? Where is she sitting? There you are. You said so much. You hit so many places. I didn't know Francis as well as many of you did. But even in, even in knowing of her and working with her, so much happened in any given moment that you had with her. And I am here to tell stories. But I did think of one thing she did for me. I don't need to go into detail. But I did her harm, emotional harm, once. And she, she nailed me, first of all. <laughs> and then she forgave me. And for that, I am forever grateful. So, to the stories. Frances came and told me after she heard these two stories, and she heard them at different times, that she loved them. She was so glad I told them. And when I found out about this memorial, they came to my mind. And thank you for letting me tell them. Can I take this off? This story I am grateful to have from a book, but from the Yamana people who live down near Tierra del Fuego, because I think it has great wisdom in it. So I pass it on in my words to you. The Yamana tribe used to go 
egg hunting on little tiny islets in the sea. They would go as the whole community and they would scour a little rocky island looking for birds' eggs. And they had to be quick because the weather around that point of land is incredibly fickle. And one sunny, calm day, they went off in their boats and arrived on this little scraggy point of land and spread out looking for eggs. And the weather changed. And suddenly they had to get into their boats and home as fast as they could. But one woman was on the far side of that little craggy island and she didn't realize quickly enough what was going on so that by the time she arrived where the boats had been, they were gone. Now she was <clears throat> quite sure that they would come back for her, but she didn't know how long it would be. The weather could be fickle or it could stay really horrible for a long time. But she was resourceful. She found herself a little cave where she could keep dry if it rained, and she found wood and other bits of debris that she could burn to keep warm because she knew how to start a fire from nothing. And she knew she had eggs. She would have enough food. And she found water by finding little crevices in the rocks where rainwater gathered. That was all fine. But what she couldn't do anything about was the loneliness. She missed her family, she missed her husband, her children, and all her relatives, and she missed her people. She was completely alone, and the weather was bad enough and changeable. So this went on for a long time. She grew so lonely it was hard to sleep at night. And one night she woke up early, just before dawn, and she thought there was somebody in the cave with her, someone near the fire blocking the light from the last embers. But when she got used to what she was seeing, she realized, yes, it was a creature, but it wasn't a human. It was a cormorant. And <clears throat> as she watched, more cormorants came in and gathered around the heat of her little fire. It was, um, it had been cold and wet for a while, and those of you who know cormorants know that they have to stand around with their big wings out to dry themselves off because they don't have the oil that other water birds have because they dive deep and it would keep them too close to the surface. So there were all these black cormorants standing around her fire, spreading out their wings, and they were talking to each other. And she realized all of a sudden she could understand what they were saying. It was her language, it was the Yamana language. And they were talking about fishing and, and babies and, and eggs and, and flying. Well, she didn't know about flying, but all the rest of it was familiar. And she got closer and closer, the better to hear them. And then somebody said something really funny and she laughed. And the cormorants turned and saw her, and they crowded to get out that little entrance to the cave, rushing, rushing, and she was saying, no, no, don't go, please don't go. I, I, I mean you no harm. But they weren't listening to her. They left. And she went out of the cave into pre-dawn light, and she saw them taking off into the sky, and she thought her heart would break, please. Don't leave me. <laughs> she reached up to, I don't know, touch them, to wave. And she saw on her arms black feathers growing. And they were on both. And her body was being covered by black feathers. And she stretched her arms, and they were wings. And she said, wait for me. And she flew up to be with them. And this last. Could I have my water, please?
Once upon a time in China, a long, long time ago, there was this scholar who knew everything there was to know about everything, except for one thing. And it bothered him that there was one thing he didn't know. He thought about it. He could have been thinking of other things. I mean, he knew 53 languages, and he could order dinner or lunch in any of them. He knew when enough was enough, but it didn't seem to help him because he was always fretting about this one thing he didn't know. He knew how to contradict the emperor and live. Good trick. But no, he wasn't satisfied. All he thought about was what he didn't know. And this was what it was. Why was it that one person in a situation could be very happy and someone else in the same situation could be miserable. And this drove him mad. And he wrote about it all the time. And he got so involved that one night, very late, he was writing, writing, writing his thoughts and his eyelids got heavy and his head drooped and the next thing you knew, he had his head down on the desk and all he could see was the light from the candle and then that kind of disappeared. And he heard a voice, a beautiful voice say, I can show you the difference now if you're ready. And he heard himself say yes. And then everything went completely black, a suffocating blackness that he was almost going to cry out in when it lifted. And he found himself in a room maybe this size with tables everywhere, and each table surrounded by people, and full, laden with the most wonderful food. It was a feast fit for an emperor. Nobody was eating, nobody was talking, everybody looked terrible. And then he saw why. There was a pair of chopsticks by each person's plate that was twice as long and then some, the length of a man's arm. Nobody could get the food to their mouths. The voice in his head said, this is hell. And everything went dark again. And when it came back to light, he thought he was in the same place. A big room, lots of tables, lots of food, lots of people. The same chopsticks too. But here everyone was laughing. Sometimes there was a smile or two would race around the room, it seemed, and then he realized what the difference was. Everybody was using those long chopsticks to feed the person across from them at the table. This is heaven, said the voice. And then everything went dark, and he woke up, and he wrote down in his book the difference between heaven and hell is other people. I think Francis was like that. in 1990 or 91, it's all kind of vague now, but when the Writers Festival hired me as their publicist and Frances was the box office manager. She was not in the office uh, when I first started and I didn't meet her uh, for a week or so until we had the, the annual staff pre-festival get-together at Elm's home. And I had been warned, as apparently had Frances, that there might be a chalk and cheese situation here, that we were um, uh, quite likely quite disparate personalities, let's just say, and apparently there was some, some trepidation amongst the uh, other 
writers' festival as, as to whether how this was going to go. Um, they had no idea that we were just practically going to fall in love at first sight. It was pretty astonishing. For one thing, of course, Francis and I saw eye to eye. And uh, that's not to say that we didn't have our disagreements. Uh, we certainly did over the decades, and they were often vigorous. And some of my most cherished moments are when Francis would pause in the middle of an argument and look at me over her glasses and say, I hate it when you're right. <laughs> not that that happened very often. I remember one time uh, Frances remarked to me, she said, you know, we're both perceived to be fairly intimidating uh, individuals. And I said, yeah, isn't that funny? And she said, well, use it wisely. <laughs> <laughs> and she certainly did, and, and I hope maybe I learned to as well. I, I'd like to now invite uh, Lynn Davis uh, to join us here. Uh, one of one of the big things in Francis' life for many years was the Michigan Festival. Greetings to everybody who is here, and especially to my sisters from the festival who are here with us. Would you uh, give us a little sign here? Thank you very much. So those of you who were at Francis's um, and Marguerite's house probably saw on Francis's study door that bulletin board that had all those funny strips of different colored plastic with different years stuck to it. Those were the wristbands that we had. And as Kevin said, festival was a very, very important part of Francis's life and also of mine and of everybody from festival who is here today. Francis, um, so the Michigan Women's Music Festival ended in 2015. It was 40 years of hot-eyed women and their children coming together in, as we called it, the fucking woods, to build, run, take down, and store a week-long festival that at its peak had three stages, three areas of child care, two kitchens, 14 performance spaces, innumerable showers, campgrounds, Porta Janes, rumors, relationships, <laughs> some years mosquitoes, some years raccoons. It was amazing. It was a brigadoon of weirdos and activists who got together every year and somehow everybody always fit in. <laughs> Frances never attended festival as a festi. She was always on crew. First box office, then accounting, and then country store. And as a regular participant in the festival spelling bee, Frances Wood, I am sure want you to know that the proper spelling of the word country in the phrase country store is C-U-N-T-R-E-E. -E. I'm sure you'll be surprised to learn that my experience of working with Frances is, is that she knew exactly what should be done and exactly how it should be done. <laughs> and I'm sure you'll be surprised to learn that I beat my head so many times against that brick wall of trying to get Frances to hurry up and I never once could do it. <laughs> I loved her dearly. And so did so many women and their children who met her and worked with her and fought with her and laughed with her. She was a sister. She was a co-worker. She was a mother. She was a mentor. She was an auntie. She was a grandmother. And she was the deepest, truest friend. She also made a great narrator of our skit at the No Talent Talent Show, <laughs> which is out there somewhere on YouTube. I met Francis in the accounting trailer in August of 1998. We were zoning, entering data from woman who lay crash charge slips into this machine. Two sentences into the conversation, I knew that I had met a friend for life. She was my touchstone. She was, she was my boon companion. 
She was the gateway for me to so many friendships with so many women whom I loved so deeply. At a time when I felt like my life had completely blown up and I could barely have enough hope that my body would somehow find the courage to draw the next breath, Francis and Marguerite were there for me. At the time of my greatest joy of my marriage to Patty, Francis and Marguerite were there for me. And it wasn't an easy friendship. She gigged me continually because I would disappear. And through my years with Francis, I have learned not to disappear as much. <laughs> I'm much better at it. The last time I saw Francis was July 20th and 21st, which was just before I left for festival. And when I walked into the living room and we made eye contact, she blurted out, I'm going to festival. <laughs> and I said, sweetheart, you are. You will be right here every single minute. And she was with us at festival. We put photos of her in our, in our tent, in our crew, where we sold merchandise. When there was a central altar put up, we moved those photos to her. And you can see over there a photo of Frances in her money belt at that altar. And it's no surprise to me that on the day that her sister Mary Beth and I left the land together, was just about the exact time that Francis's body lost its ability to swallow. Francis loved that festival, and that festival loved Francis. And my wish for all of us is that ferocity and that connection and that difficulty hone us and make us sharp and fierce in the very best we can be in this world and whatever comes afterwards. Thank you. All my Thank you, Lynn. Francis' uh, influence was felt far and wide, and, uh, uh, and there are going to be some stories today that many of us have never heard. Um, I had no idea uh, of her uh, relationship with the Port Alberni Women's Resources, for example, and uh, Jenny Snairn is here, I believe, to tell us something about that. Do you want to use that mic? Or up here. Well, I want to use this one, but I will do that. Well, of course you know. <laughs> I'm here because Marcy Cohen insisted I needed to speak, but it will be brief. In the early 1980s, a small group of women in Port Alberni got together to try to start a transition house. And not long after that, uh, one of our group went to a conference uh, for people working on violence against women. It was possibly WEVA or um, Battered Women Support Services. And when she expressed that she felt um, completely out of her league and didn't know how to proceed, Frances smiled across the room at her and said, don't worry, we'll have lunch. <laughs> Sue returned full of ideas and information, and Frances became a mentor for our organization. And she would meet us at Salt Spring, Island or Bamfield to facilitate our retreats. Because as people came and went in our and our organization evolved, um, Francis' facilitation was crucial um, to reuniting us. In her clear talking way, she made every woman understand that her work was important and part of a larger women's movement. She was always encouraging, reminding us of what we had achieved, and to look at our goals, not our obstacles. She did this for about four years, after which she said, you'll be great. It's time to move on. <laughs> I'll watch from afar. And while some of the original group may not be talking to each other, <laughs> 
when you talk to them about Frances, they all remember her really fondly. Thank you. As I mentioned, I, I first met Francis through the Writers' Festival, and uh, we worked together there for a number of years, uh, and, uh, um, um, and with uh, uh, Lorenz von Fersen, many of you know uh, Francis and Lorenz, and I became what she referred to as the Tall Person's Caucus. <laughs> when Francis moved to the Folk Music Festival, she took me along with her, as her marketing director, I think that's what I was doing. And, uh, and through that experience, I met so many amazing people who have continued to be great uh, friends and colleagues and, and uh, people that I would work together with on a project in a heartbeat. And, uh, and um, one of those people was uh, Annika Van Fleet, who uh, had known Francis for quite some time before that from uh, uh, her, her days as a co-founder of Women Against Violence Against Women. So Annika is here with us to tell us something about that. I have to say it's quite phenomenal to be with these phenomenally articulate people about their experiences with Francis. Um, anyway, I'm here mostly to speak on behalf of the uh, Vancouver Folk Music Festival. Um, I'm currently on the board at the festival and we all, we wanted to say a few words to acknowledge Frances's work, her commitment and her passion, passion for our festival. So this year is the 39th year of the Folk Music Festival and Frances was involved for many of those years. She started as a volunteer, coordinated the gate committee for many years. I think probably lots of you remember her in that role. And then eventually she was also a board member and, and finally took on the position of the general manager. And she stuck with the festival through the many ups and downs and crises of this festival, which I'm assuming probably most of you know about. Periods of financial crisis, staff crisis, rain years, etc. And she, Frances was always there. In a lot of ways, she was the heart of the folk festival. She kind of embodied the values uh, in her work and in her personal life. Uh, if I was not sure about what to do, she was someone that I could ask, get an honest answer from, and know that the basis of her, of her advice was based on our shared values. I could trust her. She got married to Marguerite at the festival. Yeah. Um, and for me, she was a larger than life figure. I like the word Amazon, actually. I think that really fits. And though I respected and liked her, I was also a little scared of her, which seems to be a bit of a theme here. <laughs> <laughs> there was something about her that inspired me to be the best. And she was just one of those people that I always wanted to impress and please. Um, Amy Newman, a current board member, uh, relate this story of her memories of Frances. Uh, she said, when we visited her in the office, as we did when our daughters were young in the Folkfest office, my daughters knew her as the purple lady. Uh, since she usually wore purple and gave them purple pens and would draw purple pictures. So the girls always looked forward to seeing the purple lady called Frances. The other capacity I know Frances uh, in was at WAVA, Women Against Violence Against Women Rape Crisis Center. She was one of the founding mothers of the organization. I joined WAVA, became a crisis line worker and part of the collective in the 1980s. And there was an aura of awe around all the founding mothers. <laughs> and as a fledgling, fledgling baby feminist at the time, the mothers were our inspiration. They were these amazing women. And Frances was that for me. She mentored many of us through our processes of politicization and growing up. I want to thank her. I say thanks to her for her contributions to both those organizations. I'm 
just having a quick scan of the crowd to see if Minna is here yet. There she is, apparently. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, skip ahead for a moment because Minna can't stay with us for very long, but she has a, a, a very exciting and important project that we'd like to uh, announce and share with you. Uh, this is another one of the amazing people uh, from the original team that I joined at the Folk Music Festival, Minna Schindlinger. I'm going to try this. I'm slightly shorter than Kevin, so it should be all right. Somebody let me know if one of these buttons pops. I'm not sure about this shirt. <laughs> but I knew I had to wear purple. I'm just going to say, Lynn Davis reminded me, um, one of the great things about Frances going to Michigan every year was that I got to stay in her apartment and drive her car for three weeks while she did it. And one year, uh, that, one year that that happened, uh, having that car, which is a great big blue Volvo station wagon, some of you might remember, allowed me and my friend Nat to go and remove Nat's sister and her children from a bad domestic situation. So thank you, Frances, and thank you, Big Blue. Uh, Thank you, Marguerite, for making this happen. We're really grateful. Um, I knew Frances for most of my life as a mentor and a friend. She impacted the lives of three generations of my family, my mother, who's here, my sister, myself, my niece, and my daughter. One of my favorite uh, photos, and which is already on the board, I noticed, um, is of Frances with five-week-old Casey. Um, you can't actually ever see her face in the photos with Casey, because she's always so focused on looking at the baby. So, um, Frances and I worked together for many years at the Folk Music Festival. She taught me to love arts administration. <laughs> and, one of the, and one of the projects that I was privileged to work on with her was the early stages of the plan for the Festival Production Center, which was originally conceived with Robert Kerr, then of the Vancouver Jazz Festival, and Lindy Sisson, then of the Vancouver Children's Festival. Lindy, I think, is here. The three tallest festival managers in the city envisioned a space where their festivals would have permanent offices and flexible space to expand and contract with their seasons as festivals always do, with the added bonus of being together every day to think and plan and do that oh so important and largely invisible work of building capacity for themselves and by extension the rest of the community. That dream never did actually come to fruition for those people, but two years ago, almost to the day now, a similar dream became a reality for the Push International Performing Arts Festival, the Docs the Documentary Film Festival, Music on Main, and Touchstone Theatre. The four groups came together and created the Post at 750, a shared facility for permanent office administration and production space, where I now work. Frances was too ill to travel by the time the Post at 750 opened its doors, but she was thrilled that the space had happened, that her dream had come true for organizations that she had tremendous respect and admiration for. She was excited about the opportunities that the space would afford to the tenants and to the community. When Frances died, it occurred to me and others that some sort of long-term tribute should live inside the arts community to remember the invaluable contributions she made to all of us who she taught and trained and advised and those who will come after us and benefit from her wisdom for generations to come. One of the production spaces in the facility uh, was purpose-built for the kind of work that Frances excelled at, the thinking planning work. A room for organizations to hold planning sessions, AGMs and board meetings, a comfortable, accessible and affordable space downtown that would welcome art, artists, individuals, companies and groups, and a place that would generate revenue for the tenants to help build their capacity. The room is currently called the East Studio, and I've launched a crowdfunding campaign to raise the money to purchase the naming rights from the member tenants and call it the Francis Wasserlein Studio. I, I have set a goal of $40,000 to be raised by July 31st, 2016, which would have been Francis' 70th birthday. The money will go to the 110 Arts Cooperative who manages the facility on behalf of the four member tenant organizations. Um, we encourage people to make monthly contributions since we've got it for five months uh, if one lump sum is too hard to manage. The link to the campaign is up on Kevin McKeown's Facebook page if you're uh, friends with him, my Facebook, and of course will be on Francis's Facebook as well. 
Um, and I'll also ask Kevin to send the link to the GoFundMe campaign directly to all of you who RSVP'd for this event so that you can share it via email if you're not much of a Facebook person, which frankly I'm not, but for this, I'll do it. Um, and I look forward to bringing everyone updates as the campaign chugs along over these next few months. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really exciting uh, project, and uh, we'll have uh, another gathering on the 31st, I'm sure, when, uh, when we unveil that uh, newly named studio. I hope you're all uh, admiring my old white guy Chamber of Commerce Sunday Good Meeting outfit. The first time Frances saw me dressed like this, she looked me up and down, probably over her glasses and said, I can live with this, Kevin, but if you ever show up in tasseled loafers, I'll have to kill you. <laughs> no tassels, guess ma'am. I, uh, through Francis, uh, obviously, I met so many uh, extraordinary, powerful women who have uh, uh, inspired uh, me and, uh, and taught me so much and often kept me in my place. And, uh, and, and one of those uh, 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 women is uh, Donna Dykeman, who's here with us and is going to uh, share something with us now. Donna. Stage. I probably will ask for and appreciate your help. Although, you know, Kevin, I think both of us would look fantastic in Morgan shoes. <laughs> Although we're not wearing the purple, I'm feeling more uh, gray and silver these days. Um, thank you. Thank you. I used to be better at these. I had a brain inflammation late last year, so shit happens. Um, <laughs> but I'm really grateful to be here on uh, unceded Coast Salish territories where uh, Frances and the Folk Music Festival spent many good years before she moved to the coast with Marguerite and uh, did many more good things. This is offered in friendship, remembered, as a work in progress, which it always will be, and vice versa. And that visibility which makes us most vulnerable is that which also is the source of our greatest strength, Audre Lorde. This moment is that little girl, the vintage photo on the card I sent to you in San Francisco when your mother died. That little girl, back turned, but facing forward, one small hand reaching out, one small hand held. You felt seen, you said, later. You reached down to cut my face in both your hands, smiling, teary-eyed. I said, I didn't know that you were hidden or hiding. And you answered, well, some things are easy when you're tall, some things are not. This moment is that shit girl exclamation before listening, wrestling, words, ideas, body, mind, opinions, budding heads. We two gap-toothed, smart-ass women who said fuck a lot and offered refuge, practicalities, no pity, only awkward love. Who flew my beetle or your Volvo, the orange one, <coughs> cackling up and over that one bump, now history paved under as it happens, coming down from SFU. Some things are easier, you said, when you have weight. Some things are not. 
This moment is the look upon your face when, mid reminiscence of those hippie chick earth mama, old lady of the old man dealer bygones, you saw me, sad, sudden, right in front of you, not selling Kitsilano dream clouds, but buying them at 12. We were different then, and all our lives, yes, I was your little sis, not biological, but logical. Reached out then in new directions, held by other hands, took other roads, let go, came back around, re-collecting. Different, but the same, seen. And when you could still drive to find the perfect cup of coaster coffee, and imperfect me looking for you somewhere inside the right here, the right now of it all, puzzling out the what of it, yourself replaced with you, and loss in brain, in mind, in body, it's all one in connection. Loss of the words you loved so much and the so distinctly non-poetic but mundane questions. The drug effects, anxiety, questions that you thought I'd know a thing or two about. You thought right, then thought wrong, and then you were done with thinking. Sudden, sad, I saw you, knowing, fragile, strong, and fragile as we all are connected, a hard gift for you, for us, but thank you, I mean that, for everything. And shit, girl, some things are better when we know, some things are not. Some things are better as we age, some things are not. Some things are better when we go, some things are not. So I have honor, love, and rage for you today. It's what I have, it is. Because some things, some days, some things, my friend, are really, really not. Francis's life that I was uh, never able to share was her career as a instructor at Langara and at SFU, uh, uh, principally I think at Langara when I first met her. I do remember at one time asking if I would be allowed to sit in on one of her classes, and she gave me that look. <laughs> but uh, others were privileged to uh, be in those classes and to uh, to share her teaching role at, at uh, Langara. Uh, Janice Browning is not able to be with us today, but Catherine Grace uh, is here with a message. Uh, if she could step forward. Um, so I'm Catherine Grace, and I met um, Francis in 1999. Um, and in 2001, she married my wife, Maria, and I. Um, and one of the greatest gifts that Francis gave me, I think, was um, to be a friend who was my mother's age and who was a femme lesbian. And um, it, was, it was an honor to be her friend. Um, but I'm here tonight because I walked, or today, because I walked in and Marguerite asked me to do something. <laughs> Marguerite and Francis ask you to do something, you just do it. So, <laughs> So I'm uh, reading the words of Janice Browning. It was the early 1990s. Frances and I both lived in East Van and would often carpool in her burgundy Volvo sedan. <laughs> <laughs> come up. 
um, to work in South Vancouver, then back to our respective homes. Those were good times, sharing our love of the Vancouver landscape as she drove north along Clark Drive until it plummeted down around East 33rd. It was like riding up to the apex of a roller coaster. For five years, though for only a single semester, we co-taught at Langara College in the Women's Studies Department. Two people couldn't have been more different. Francis went to a private school in Vancouver, Little Flower Academy. I always found it amusing that a woman like Frances would go to a school <laughs> called the Little Flower. <laughs> I went to public schools in Canada's Motor City, Windsor, Ontario. She was tall and white. I am not so tall and black. Frances was an out lesbian. I am and have been het. Partly because of our shared commitment to navigate and respect those differences, or maybe despite them, we developed a deep mutual understanding that grew out of our experience of having to develop and deliver a consciousness-raising type introductory course about historical and contemporary women's issues. Although many of our fundamental life experiences were different, we nurtured a friendship rooted in our shared experience of teaching for social change and justice for women. We shared similar goals. We intellectually pushed prodded and challenged each other and our students. When I was hired in early 1992, I was the youngest teaching member in the department, under 30, and the only woman of color. Sometimes it was frustrating asserting my place in a space that had been reserved almost exclusively for middle or upper class white feminists. Frances understood that. We grappled hard to share a platform that would help many students as well as ourselves, find a place to express our dissatisfaction with the injustices of society and search for a roadmap leading to a better world. We knew we had to do this on equal footing, despite the fact that I was also about a foot shorter than Francis. It was a delicate balancing act. In hindsight, I think we did the best we could. There were times when the balance shifted to favor one or the other of us, depending on what issues were being addressed or tackled. In spite of the political minefields, we stumbled through each semester with a deeper appreciation of how we could lean on each other as friends and not just colleagues. I still have several postcards that Frances would send from wherever she was to wherever I was, with artistically crafted handwriting in purple ink celebrating International Women's Day on March 8th. Frances was generous of spirit and refused to take the middle road. She genuinely cared about others, especially the disempowered. Like all of our cohorts in the department, Frances had an important role nurturing the hearts and minds of anyone willing to hear and share stories to improve life for women. We shared our frustration at other people's and society's boneheadedness. We got along, sometimes we even had fun. We marveled at how it can be so hard to be just who we are, to accept and respect difference, to make a better world for future generations. One of the highlights of working with Francis was listening to her seamlessly deliver her introductory talk about becoming a feminist, and hearing her carefully constructed history lesson about the pitfalls and successes of women's organizing in Canada. Now I wish we'd recorded those lessons. She could recite names, dates, and particulars from memory. She took care to personalize stories, so it felt like you'd participated in some of the protests even if you weren't born when they'd happened. After comparing Francis's wide vision of history with my more contemporary cultural criticisms, I learned to appreciate that we all have stories that can shape and impact the world if we are just brave enough to do our part and articulate whatever that part may be. It is a pleasure and a privilege for me to have so many memories of Francis's time on Earth. I cherish those memories dearly. I hope there will be more of a public record to honor the many good deeds Frances has done in her too short lifetime. My heart goes out to her many close friends, 
her family, and her life partner, Marguerite. We may have lost a warrior, but have gained so much for having known her. There are a few others who were not able to be here with us uh, and have sent their their messages with others. Uh, one is uh, Judy Lynn, and uh, uh, Judy's daughter Lucy is here uh, uh, with with her little boy. Hello, and uh, she's going to join us on stage here. So Judy can't be here, but I can, and Judy's grandson over there. Many of you see pictures of him, possibly far more than you'd like. Uh, I know Judy is very sorry not to be here. She would really, really enjoy to, having this time with you and, and remembering Francis and hearing these stories. Um, if somebody could just ensure that he doesn't leave the house. I mean. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read uh, Judy's story about Francis, and then I have a few words of my own. Um, I'm so sorry I cannot be with you all to celebrate Francis's big life. I first met Francis in 1978 at a party in Vancouver. Neither of us was living in Vancouver at the time, but I had returned to my Vancouver community to pack up my communal home on Quebec Street after my child custody battle required me to return to Ontario. Francis understood my struggle. When I finally returned to Vancouver in 1981, Frances, and many of you at her memorial today, was embroiled in organizing Women Against Violence Against Women, Waiver Right Crisis Center, an alternative to rape relief. I jumped in with both feet and my ongoing bond with Frances was cemented. Frances became part of my extended lesbian family. When I went through a difficult breakup in the early 90s, Frances was the go-to person for my young daughter, Lucy, who was also hurting from the breakup and was unable to communicate with her angry mom. I rem I, interestingly, I don't remember this, but I, I, <laughs> I, love, I love reading about this story from Judy's memory. I remember her, me, coming home after visiting Frances and telling me with the strength imbued in her via Frances that I have a relationship with Janet too. And your anger is your anger, not mine. <laughs> that sounds so much like it. It's not okay to undermine my relationship with her because you're hurting. I love that Lucy sought out my friends for support, and in this case, Francis. Over the years, Francis has always been there, an unspoken, and sorry, an outspoken, larger than life oracle, sometimes hard to stand up to when we disagreed, and we occasionally did, but solidly there for her friends. I am proud to count myself as one of those friends. I'd like to share an excerpt from an email dialogue we had in uh, April 2012 uh, regarding Judith Arcana, American feminist poet and writer. Francis, I think this quote must be from her book, 1979, What If Your Mother? If we want girls to grow into free women, brave and strong, we must be those women ourselves. Francis, Judy. The full quote is, <laughs> We must live as if our dreams had been realized. We cannot simply prepare other younger daughters for strength, pride, courage, and beauty. It is worse than useless to tell young women and girls that we have done and been wrong, that we have chosen ill, that we hope they'll be more lucky. If we want girls and women, uh, girls to grow into free women, brave and strong, we must be those women ourselves. I will bring the framed quote that Janet gave me to the next half of circle. <laughs> On another note, this is still the email from Judy. On another note, and relevant to the Sappho circle topic last night, a quote that came to me this afternoon. This quote, too, had a profound effect on me in the early 70s, so I suppose I can treat it like a piece of advice. The personal is political. Love, Judy. Frances embodied the personal is political and was herself a woman who inspired other women and girls to be free women, brave and strong. 
by being brave and strong herself and outspoken herself. My thanks to Marguerite and Francis for their annual end of summer parties, a bringing together of women and men, new and old, young and very young, old and very old. Marguerite, you and Francis were always there to weave webs of connection, community, and creativity. And that's the end of uh, Judy's letter. I'm one of those younger daughters, spoken of in the quote Judy and Francis referenced. I was and am so fortunate to have had women such as my mom, Francis, and many of you here today as the women who came before, who showed me their lives of passion, strength, courage, and vulnerability, compassion, beauty, and love, what it means to be a brave and strong woman, and uh, I am now showing and, and will show my son. Francis has been an inspiration to me as a community organizer, activist, and woman who gets shit done. <laughs> I run a dance company that employs 12 people and produces social dancing events in Vancouver. I'm frequently told how special is what I do for people and what, is, what a wonderful, welcoming, fun, joyous community there is in large part due to my efforts. I'm also occasionally told that I'm intimidating. <laughs> Larger than life, or just plain scary. I suspect, and I know, Frances was told these things too. I know I found her scary as a teenager. I actually, uh, I met her through Judy, but also I worked on the gate, uh, the gate community, or the gate uh, committee at, at the Folk Fest, and knowing what a fuck up I was as a teenager, I just, I hope that I was a good gate volunteer. I really don't remember. I just, I hope. <laughs> She had no time for my shit as a teenager, that's for sure. I, there were times when she would call me out on things that Judy and Janet would not. And I remember going to, to Neil or my friends and, and saying like, can you believe what she said? And then not long later I would be like, yeah, yeah that, was, that, was, that was fair. And I remember those, those occasions. Um, as I imagine was the case for her and I, and I know from the stories you said today, I have little concern for the fact that some find me intimidating. I'm a woman who gets shit done. I bring compassion, love, joy, passion, and diligence to my company and my community. Some, may people, some people may find that intimidating, but I don't let that dampen my enthusiasm. I'm grateful to Frances and women like her for being my inspiration as a younger daughter. I am and we are fortunate to have known her. Intimidating is a word that keeps coming up as we, and uh, when, when Francis passed, there was a lot of chatter on Facebook uh, among friends, and that word also came up, and uh, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't mention something that uh, another friend, Walter Kwan, who is not here with us today, um, wrote at that time. He said, I think that what uh, a lot of people found intimidating in Francis is that when she spoke with you, she made eye contact and she was totally present in the moment with you. And that's something that people really aren't used to and perhaps did find a little intimidating. So I thank Walter for that insight. Someone else who's not able to be with us uh, today, I'm sorry about the reverb, I'm not very good with mics, um, um, is uh, Francis' sister, Mary Beth. And uh, Kathy Lewis is here with a message from Mary Beth. Wow. I'm sitting over there and I'm listening to everybody talk and now I'm looking at this incredible room of people and thinking what a testament to Frances and the effect that she had on so many people, many who aren't here today. So, amazing. Um, I met Francis in 1999, I think, as a result of seeing a piece of Marguerite's pottery. That's a whole other story. But, um, she married my wife and I in 2005, and then we were blessed to be married with her and Marguerite and Rebecca and Janae at the festival. So I feel very blessed for that. So this is from Mary Beth. Um, she said, did you know that 
She couldn't walk when I was born, 11 months and 26 days after her birth, but was talking a blue streak. <laughs> In fact, she talked for me. Mary Beth wants a cookie. So much that I didn't talk until I was three. I when I started talking in paragraphs. She said, did you know that she called me Honey Beth? Did you know that when she was 12, Frances won a blue ribbon at the California State Fair for a light blue sheath dress that she made in 4-H? <laughs> uh, did you know that she learned to make only one dish in 4-H cooking? <laughs> Fried hot dogs in very mildly spiced ketchup. <laughs> Not a blue ribbon candidate, but one that we ate a lot when our mother was ill for several weeks. She said, did you know that she didn't drive until she was in her early 30s? She could steer, shift, or brake, or step on the gas when she tried to learn at 16, but she couldn't actually do any two or three of them at the same time. <laughs> did you know that when we discovered Google Hangout, that we saw each other and talked with each other sometimes every day? And you should already know that she was the best sister in the world. Very bad. Frances contributed so much in so many uh, fields and, and in so many endeavors with regards to support. Uh, for women uh, and women in, uh, in, in situations that, uh, that we we're all, all too familiar with, and she was uh, so much on the forefront. And um, uh, Sheila Nyman, who is the former ED for the Crystal Society and involved in the from the Lower Sinel Camine in the Okanagan Valley. And I'm here because, like so many of the words spoken before I was out here, uh, Francis is a huge mentor for me. Um, and the words that I'm hearing are the experiences that some people had are the same as for me. I'm the former executive director for Crystal Society. We operate uh, women's recovery homes for women. Right now, there's three houses, four programs. They still exist. And I uh, resigned in 2007. It was a while after Francis was finished. And I think it was the Port Alberni woman who said that, you know, when it was all set up and <coughs> Francis said, okay, you go now. You can do this. And, I'll be just over here. And, and Francis was always just over there for me because there was always struggles. I had a vision. I had a vision and of um, a, a vision and a belief that women can heal. Women who have been harmed and are immersed in self-destruction in the downtown east side in various places and drugs and alcohol through uh, their experiences of trauma and harm and, and life and trying just so hard always to be what we are taught and groomed to be as women and yet never making the mark. Many of us succumb. And I believe that if women could have a space, an environment that was conducive to their healing, where they would be nurtured and reminded that they were once little girls, treasured, taken care of, that they could remember that and they could tap that place as a recipe in each one of us. And we all know how to heal ourselves. We just need to remember. And an environment that's conducive to that. That's all you need is to provide that. And women, women will wake up. They will remember who they are. And Francis believed that too. 
and I always felt her behind me because it wasn't an easy thing to get those houses going. Yeah, the houses had existed. There was one and then two. They were broken down houses. I mean, literally the field ceilings were falling in. And we got to move to one house and then a second house. And there was a lot of challenges. There was Vancouver, Richmond help, and then it became Vancouver Coastal help. And, and then there was licensing. You remember that, don't you? <laughs> Uh, and they, we were, we were developing something that was never done before. We weren't coming from a 12-step place. We were coming from women's empowerment place. We were strong women, and there were strong women on that board. We had a different idea, and it didn't fit what had been written in, in papers, and, and didn't fit standards. And uh, it was really scary getting that off the ground and getting them to believe we needed to have the license. And it was really scary coming up against all of that. But there was Frances. And just listening to the words today, I'm like, yes, that's what she did. That's what she provided for me as I, as I worked. And everybody worked together to get those houses going. They exist today. Christmas Society owns the, the first house. It's, there are new houses. And then there's two other houses. There's many women. I can't count how many women that Francis time here on this earth that it made a difference for them. They don't know, they didn't meet Francis. She was behind the scenes. But they're alive today. I remember one time sitting at a Vancouver Coastal Health meeting and looking around the table at, at some of the people sitting there. They were executive directors and directors and program managers of all kinds of uh, homeless initiatives and other agencies in the downtown east side, and they've been through our houses. And, and so Frances, while many people, and the women whose lives she touched, they don't know consciously or they didn't see visually that she touched them, but she did. I um, am very much in the many years that I've worked and worked with people and practiced with an elder and did initiations of my spiritual practices of my ancestors, I uh, know that everything is energy. And, you know, Francis stood behind me energetically or just in, in guiding me and mentoring me. That went right through me to those women. You know, just as our ancestors, each time they touched a plant or harvested an animal to eat, they thanked it. That's energy. It doesn't, it, it goes, it just grows and goes. So, all of us carry the energy of Francis. And many, many women and people, period, are healing and continue to heal because of the beautiful spirit that she was and is today energy in, if you, in native science, if you want to call it that, means spirit. It's the same thing. Then, ma'am, thank you for your time. All my relations. Also, we have been tuned with the work of the Francis in the field. I'd like to uh, ask Angela Martin McDougall of the Head of Women's Support Services to, uh, to come up and, and say a word.
taking as long to get up here as I will to speak. Uh, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge uh, Francis's great support of, of myself personally, but also of social uh, issue documentaries in Vancouver specifically around uh, issues of white assault, AIDS, homophobia, etc. She's been a really uh, well, I mean, after hearing all these stories, I think Francis has been everywhere. <laughs> Everything. Uh, but I, I, I wanted to uh, just say a few words about how much her impact uh, uh, strongly felt talk for me uh, in, in my uh, development as a feminist and as a, uh, finding my own voice in filmmaking. Uh, her feedback, uh, she was on advisory committees for my work and, and also responded to the films I was making and uh, it was greatly appreciated. Um, uh, her words, her engagement, her strongest gaze, and what I knew what she was thinking. By the way, she looked over my glasses, her glasses, which uh, certainly been mentioned um, many times. Um, all these things will be really remembered and her voice will carry on within all of the <coughs> Well, since Francis told this story at my 50th birthday party, went to my parents' amusement, uh, one of our interesting bonding moments in our, the early days of our friendship uh, took place at the Dufferin Hotel, where we'd gone for a dead point of beer. And as one does if one's grown up in the, in the same city, uh, we were talking about what school did you go to, and that's when I found out she was from Little Flower, which I also thought was interesting. <laughs> and I told her that I had gone to John Oliver. And she said, oh, did you know a Ken Law? <laughs> and I said, yeah, Ken and I were in grade 11 and 12 together. And Ken was actually the first guy I ever slept with. <laughs> well, I thought Francis was going to fall off her chair. <laughs> but then she said, that's amazing. Ken was the last guy I ever saw. <laughs>
When my dad was sick 10 years ago, she dropped everything to sit vigil with us and to regale us with truly harrowing tales of their youth. <laughs> and a few years later, she showed up with a bracelet that she made for my sister when my sister was ill. And each bead represented an important person in my sister's life. And of course, there was a big Francis bead on that bracelet too. Well, I guess that I'm never going to grow up to be Francis Wazerline. <laughs> or, or the Prime Minister. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> but I will always keep her spirit and her warmth in my heart. And I know that she would want all of us to know, yes, you are loved. Thank you. Not all of uh, Francis's uh, proteges were ne'er do wells like myself. Um, many have gone on to, to great success in many fields, and uh, it's not my privilege to, uh, as we approach the end of our time together here, to uh, introduce um, uh, someone who considered uh, Francis a great mentor in her life, Mabel Omar is the MLA for Ventura Kensington. Thank you so much, Kevin. And um, <clears throat> I first met uh, Francis, uh, similar to Morgan, in uh, taking the uh, the women's history class at uh, women's studies at Linkera, and. Um, I was struck by her, her very generous spirit. And uh, through taking that class at Langer, along with um, Patty Moore and, and Denise Browning and, and Dorothy Kidd, it opened my eyes to the world of activism and the pursuit of social justice and the meaning of women's liberation. And Frances really embodied what it meant to be not just a radical feminist, but a radical lesbian feminist and pursuing uh, liberation, which was uh, quite something. It, it uh, opened my eyes, it transformed my world, and it really uh, provided a path uh, for me to go forward and make a difference in the world. And um, with, uh, with Frances, I was, uh, when I attended her class, I was very shy, very quiet, and um, you know, didn't want to say a word, but I always felt very comfortable with her. And I think when I first met her, I loved Frances. And uh, she had a very special place for me. And when I started getting involved with the women's movement in Vancouver, and I found myself running for elected office in Vancouver, Kensington as an MLA, uh, everybody told me that, um, you know, I wasn't going to win, I was the underdog, and um, that running as the candidate, I could not run as an open lesbian of color because uh, there had never been uh, an open lesbian of color elected <laughs> in Eastern Canada. And so I pondered this and I had a conversation with uh, Francis back and forth and it was, uh, there was never an option to not be out. <laughs> elected and to represent that office. The purpose was to make a change, to make a difference for people, for women, and to fight against discrimination and to uh, walk along the path for liberation for all people. So it was never any question. And uh, the media were quite interested that, that I was elected and got a lot of support from the immigrant community, uh, even in the, in the Catholic Church. But uh, I was elected and interestingly, uh, I was also lesbian baited uh, in my first election, in my second election, uh, but it never, um, it never took root. And uh, one of the things that uh, when, I, when I think about Frances and how, what a mentor she meant to me, and I've heard it reflected in so many stories shared here, is that 
I feel that Frances not just supported me and was a, was a mentor and inspiration, but she really charted the way in terms of when I think of Francis and you know what's the way forward for our society to pursue social justice, it really is along to continue along that <coughs> radical feminist perspective of genuine liberation, and that's what uh, that's what Francis imbued, imbued in me, and that's what I see. And when I think of her and what she means, she's in my heart, and that's. The, I will continue along that journey uh, that Francis has laid out. I want to share one story. Of, um, it's not it's not overtly political, but it was, it was before I was elected. I I went to uh, I was single at the time, so a group of um, carload of lesbians of color, First Nations lesbians. We decided we're all single. Let's go for a good time on the Sunshine Coast. <laughs> There happened to be a lesbian dance. And we're all singles, so we're like, yeah, that's where we're going to go for a good time. So we went to Roberts Creek, Mark was there, and it was um, uh, the whole room full of white women, but we were, we were all there and ready for a good time, up for it. So I go up to Francis and I say, Francis, you know, I'm, I'm single, and can, can you, you know, maybe introduce to me some single lesbians or point them out, you know, a lot of couples here. And, she looks at me just very matter of fact and she says, Mabel, what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> if you see someone you like, you know, strike up a conversation, have a dance, and if you're lucky, take her home. <laughs> and so I was a little bit taken aback, but I thought, wow, oh, that's, uh, that's Francis and that's, um, that's some good advice. <laughs> Yes, and um, just reflecting, it's um, you know it's such a profound message around uh, that was that was previously shared about Francis wanting us to know that that we are loved. And that moving forward in changing the world and fulfilling our potential around how special each of us are and how we all deserve to be treated and valued in our society, that it's through genuine liberation. And I'll be holding that in my heart and Francis will be continuing to light that way. So thank you very much. I love you, Francis. We all do. She uh, was such a blessing in my life and with love to Marguerite and all of you friends. And may we continue on our paths for social justice and liberation, my friends.
Texas uh, when a large group of us started the, the Waiver Rape Crisis Center. And of course, we were all equals. But I remember Francis as a leader, yeah, very thoughtful, inspiring. And, and my button says, feminist sister. A year, uh, uh, you know, fast forward from there. A year after the massacre of 14 women in 1989 at the Polytechnic at the University of Montreal, Francis and I were both giving speeches at a protest event. Uh, she told me afterwards that, uh, and I quote, uh, when I speak these words, I can feel them in every cell of my body, right down to the soles of my feet. And she gave me a copy of her speech, and in it she said, keep hope in your heart, use your voice, speak the truth of our lives, our stories are different and the same. Say them. Speak for the silenced voices. Speak for yourselves. On behalf of myself and everyone involved in the Women's Monument Project, I want to acknowledge uh, Francis's a tremendous co contribution to the creation of the Women's Monument. From the early beginnings, uh, Frances recommended the project to her women's study students as a practical placement in the women's movement. Students joined up in order to gain experience and report back to their women's studies class. I just sort of figured that out recently while I was writing this. Uh, I wish I'd asked her <laughs> what they said. A number of them went on to become committee members. Uh, the first direct mail list, it was a list of over 400 people who were sent a letter uh, asking for donations to the Women's Monument Project were all from Frances's address book. <laughs> because she advised uh, the committee that that's what we should do to start fundraising. Uh, there were some frightening times for the project. It was rare to see a women's group in Canada be so frequently attacked in the media. Frances stood by the project unequivocally, and she acted as our MC at milestone events, and she spoke out at key meetings over a period of seven years, eight years. At some point, Frances said, that the city of Vancouver should step up and pay for the monument as they do for other works of art. She spoke passionately about this at a meeting with the Public Art Committee. Now that was a scene well worth witnessing. <laughs> Francis showed such strength and conviction and loyalty and kindness. The project was ridiculed and challenged for a number of years. It was surrounded by a chronic public denial of male violence against women. Fundraising was a serious challenge. I never told Francis that I secretly wanted to admit defeat and run away to Arizona, which I know nothing about. <laughs> But somehow, Frances knew how I felt. She said to me, look, if you don't get to build the monument, you have to understand that all the public discussion about violence against women is a significant accomplishment in itself, that that is enough. It was so kind of her, so smart, I can't tell you. She opened the door, and I could run away. <laughs> Later, on December 6, 1997, Francis was the MC at the unveiling of the Women's Monument, called Marker of Change, guiding a thousand people through the ceremony. I can't imagine the monument being built without her and her unwavering belief in the potential of art to open people's minds to a better world. 
In 2013, at our request, Francis wrote the Vancouver Park Board a letter in support of keeping Marker of Change the sole monument in Thornton Park. She wrote, Marker of Change is meant to stand for a very long time as witness to events and responses to those events which will speak our truth long after our own voices are silent. From all of us, thank you, Francis. Now it's time to give Francis the last word. In 2005, Francis participated in a video speak out for a website community called Remember Our Sisters Everywhere. She was asked for her reflections on the denial of violence against women in society and asked to suggest some ways to bring about change.